wonderful place to be thus far. Looking forward to what the Lord has in store for us the rest of the time. I'm going to go ahead and look at our bulletin and see what's going to be going on this week. Got happy birthdays going out this week to Miss Michaela Mann, who's celebrating a birthday today. May God bless you. There will be youth choir practice tonight at 5 p.m. We have our um, Christmas performance this evening, so remember that. Today is our Missionary Sunday offering. Please give and pray for the, these special people doing God's work. And our track of the month tracks didn't make it to the treat bags. They, they got misplaced, but we're looking for them. So uh, remember that. Our Christmas program will be tonight in our evening service. Please pray for all involved. And it's always a good time around here. People look forward to the Christmas um, plays and stuff that we have, so be much in prayer for that. And then the little story, Bethlehem and Calvary. There was no room in Bethlehem for him who left his throne to seek the lost at countless cost and make their, make their own gifts his own. Make, make their gifts, griefs, their own. But there was room on Calvary upon the cross of shame for him to die uplifted high to bear the sinner's blame. There was no room in Bethlehem and in the world today. Men will not give him room to live and bid him turn away. But there is room on Calvary and there he stands to give a home to all who heed his call and look to him and live. There was no room in Bethlehem for Christ, the Prince of Kings, from throne and crown to earth come down with healing in his wings. But there is room in Calvary for sinners to abide, and who will come may find a home in Jesus crucified. I like that. We did have a card come in that says, Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Mapscott Baptist, for the Christmas blessing. We love serving the Lord with you all. You're terrific. Thank you for loving us and keeping us in your prayers. John and Jewel Bragg. Remember them? All right. Do we have any testimonies or specials this morning? I want to stand up this morning and uh, it's taken me many minutes to thank the church for the beautiful poinsettias for you all for my brother passed away and also for the Bibles that were sent in his name for the ladies prayer but most of all I thank you all for for thanking the people for praying for me and for your love Amen. this is true I'm called and everything to me, but most of all, I thank the dear Lord that it is so true. It is so true. Any trials in life that we get through, of course, when something like this happens, like we did, you still have any questions about if you did accept the Lord, but I have to lose that with God. Right. But I'm so thankful that I know that he leaves with me. And he does come with me, and I do know that peace. And only he can call He has been with me through many, many things. And he has proven himself absolutely wonderful to me. And I'm so grateful for it. I'm grateful for it many years ago. Now don't think that I've always been a true Christian because I haven't. But he reached out when I was very young and touched my heart. And I knew I actually went home and dreamed about going to hell. I, and the preacher used to scare me so bad. And so at the age of 13, I did come to accept him as my Savior. And I can say one thing, he's been no matter that I haven't been true to him. He's been true to that. Amen. And I thank him for that. And now as we get older, I'm so thankful to know if he doesn't even come back and I go to the grave, I'm going to be with my Lord. Yeah. Right. And that is such a peace and such a blessing in the world. And I do love it. And I just pray that I will ever be glad to be. And thank all of you. And I love you all. 
Amen. Come on up. Her babe, does she realize she's holding the bread of life? As she rocks him to sleep, does she know he's a rock of ages that will stand through time? What a day was that first Christmas! What a gift to this old world! All the glory of the Father in a manger lays unfurled. Stars go on parade while angels sing. Cause a young virgin girl holds heaven's king. What a day was that first Christmas when redemption's plan was born. Stars go on parade while angels sing Cause a young virgin girl holds heaven's king What a day was that first Christmas When redemption's plan was born
our practice tonight will be for all those who are singing in the play. Okay, for all those singing in the play, for these choir practice. Okay, okay. All right, others, testimonies or specials? Miss Maria. <laughs> service remember them and just continue to remember Stephen and encourage him so hopefully they'll be able to make it out tonight do we have any other spoken requests starting off my right Shirley's niece calls this morning called her this morning from Virginia she's all alone and she has fallen and hurt herself mm. and there's nobody to help her she said that she laid in the floor for quite a while but finally felt impressed to call on Jesus to help her get up and he did yeah. and she finally got up in the bed or something. but anyway she was pleading for help you can mm -hmm. just tell that I mean there's nobody there around and nobody to call on or anything like that she asked us to pray for her this morning appreciate it continue to remember mom and please remember my children Remember me and mine, we remember Amanda, she drove in from Kentucky this morning. It's our grandson Jonathan coming in with a new baby from Minnesota. Mm -hmm. Have a safe trip. Mm -hmm. Still remember our boss and remember Leanne. She's going to be facing a long surgery come first of the year. She's got to have both arms operated on and uh, they're going to have to do <coughs> surgery on her, so just keep her in prayer. Mm -hmm. I want to 
thank you for answering prayer. Can we have, have a stand and Brian's home and go back to the well? And just remember my children and grandchildren. Continue to remember Linda and I and the loss in our family. Linda's still in a lot of pain over the shingles, so she still needs your prayers. And uh, my sister-in-law, Dolores Ward, she's in the hospital with uh, a lot of fluid on her, and they don't know why she's gathering up so much fluid, and she needs her prayers. You remember my sister, Barbara, and my family in Boston. I still remember me my back, and remember my sons, and remember my children, the loss of my family, the present nursing home. Doctor's aunt, Maxine Johns. She's had three strokes and she's not able to communicate. She's like 96 years old. And then her son, um, Jerry Johns, he's in four stage prostate cancer. And her other son, Harold Johns, has Parkinson's and he's like in the last part of that. And then uh, the doctor's cousin, Emma. And her husband sat was in that, that car wreck and sat he passed away. So remember that family. And I have a very special one, so I want to please. This is always pleasant to remember my children and, and I have another special request. I have some very special requests. Remember, remember Jim Stone too. Yeah. I still remember Roger Smith and Jack Witt who were coming from COVID. He's really had a hard time this last round with it. Remember my niece, Cheryl Ripple? She is a receptionist at Pine Lodge, and she has been tested positive for COVID. And uh, my, our oldest daughter, Pam, she's a nurse at the VA. She's in quarantine now. Two in administration and two nurses on her floor has uh, positive COVID, so she's in quarantine. Just remember all of them in the medical state, right. trying to fight this COVID. See? Remember Jenny, she's not going to hospital. Okay. Yeah, I'd like to ask the church to remember the uh, my lost children and to also remember Laura there who's working her mom to death and she is in the war slap house. So remember her in your first place. Okay. On my left. Please continue to remember remember the loss of both my and those families and continue to remember my dad for his salvation and my mother. I'm gonna thank God for being Jacob home safe to us. Um, he traveled for about 18 hours and uh, was about a minute from home and he was in a car accident, but he's okay. We're all from my family, so we're going to roll off. Junior Mills, the, the pastor called about us praying for. Mm -hmm. um, his wife told me to thank everybody for praying. I called a number, the only number I had, I thought it was their home number, and it was Junior cell number, and I got a hold of him. Has anybody else heard about him? Well, anyway, um, he said that he went to, he started feeling like he couldn't breathe, and he went to uh, Appalachian. He said they weren't doing anything for him. He thought he was going to die. And I don't know how he made it to the VA hospital, but when he got there, he, he has COVID. When he got there, they said, you're ready to go on a vent. Oh my goodness. But they started him on all the treatments they gave to President Trump. This is what he told us. And he had been on 100% oxygen. And that day they had lowered it. It was a couple of days after the pastor called. And um, he told me that his wife has it at home and his son. So when I got off, he gave me her number. He said he was getting better and that um, they were going to give him the vaccine in a couple of days, the new vaccine. Mm -hmm. And um, 
I called his wife. She's real sick, but she's getting better. And the son, all that's done to him is cause him to have a call. But she wanted me to thank you all for praying and everybody else. And um, I wanted to tell you guys something about these vaccines. I don't know if you know this. But the first one that came out, Pfizer, it's the only one that wasn't started off with a fetal cell line from an aborted baby. The other ones all were made from the fetal cell line of aborted baby. So I, for one, will not take anything but the Pfizer. And uh, I just wanted to let y'all know that. Other requests? Yeah, I remember Allison Bibbs. Mm -hmm. I yeah. remember them. They didn't want us to really out like to go and they break their time. Okay. I have a younger brother, Roger. He uh, has problems with his feet and his ankles, and he, I haven't seen him in a month with everything going on. When I went up, he uh, was all like, looked like he was walking two miles an hour on a cane. Uh, he also has challenges of schizophrenia. He just needs a lot of prayers. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to thank the Lord for answering my prayers. Okay. Any unspoken by that praised hand? This time I'd like to ask Brother Jeff if we would at least in prayer. Brother Jeff? As Father, we thank the Father for all you've done for us, Father, Lord, and his past words. The gifts will be better, Lord. We pray, Father, for the very best, Lord, that we know the needs of each other in our hearts, Lord. Father, we ask you, Father, this is a bunch of Father, God bless you, Father, you don't be done, Father, we ask you, Father, this continues to be with the services this morning, Lord, that we have been preaching. The words to say, you know, uh, to open our ears and let our hearts and heart to hear the word. We just love you and thank you, Father, for all you've done and what you want to do. Lord, we pray, Father, for one here that doesn't pay you, Lord. We pray that they'll come today for us turning to the Lord. Father, go on with us to go around in the service before we go again and ask us in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, I need Miss JoJo and Pastor Marty to come on up. Got your Christmas presents for you from the church. I always like to give a little something special for our pastor and his wife during right. Christmas time. We appreciate y'all and all that you do. Right. Love y'all. Thank, Thank you. Merry Christmas. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> 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 all righty. This time we'll have, well, have we had any anniversaries in the last week? I actually remembered. Any anniversaries? No? We'll have our birthday song. If you've had a birthday in the last week, like to come forward and celebrate with us, you're more than welcome. If not, everybody stand, wave hands around, and sing number one. <laughs> Are you on? 193. 193. First and last verse. <laughs> I am so glad that my Father in hell tells of his love in the book he has killed. Wonderful things in the Bible I see. This is the dearest that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. 
Philippian Bibles up to Philippians. Um, we got a little bit more done in the foyer out there this week, and want to thank you ones who helped out. I think um, Brother Ken probably saved us from a disaster. I was ready to turn loose on that air gun. I was going to, that airless is a spray. Probably would have put Brother Bob in the hospital, but <laughs> anyway, he and Brother Ricky, they talked us out and we rolled it, so it, it went a lot better, so it's a lot cleaner. Tomorrow they're going to lay the carpet down and put in some Cortec right just outside of this door. And I don't know how much more we'll get done this week because of Christmas, but uh, Brother Jeff is off work, and so he said he'd like to work a little bit. If anybody else would like to help out, we need to do some trim, put up outlet covers and so forth. Got the uh, heat pump units in, so I'm sure Brother John, uh, you know, I'm, the holidays are busy, but I'm sure he'll get to them whenever time is good. His wife's a taskmaster. She doesn't let him out very much. <laughs> The truth is, we found out the truth. He really wasn't uh, quarantined the other day. She just wanted to get some things done around the house, so she quarantined him. All that was made up. So, you're flipping fours, where we're at. So thank you. Thank you so much for all your help with all of that. Um, and then we'll. Uh, all right, Philippians 4, are we there in the Bibles? Okay. Um, wanted to uh, just again just uh, encourage you to keep our country in mind and, and just be in prayer. Um, no matter what happens, it's going to be okay. You know, we still have the Lord in our Bible and the Holy Spirit. But um, I'm still praying, praying regularly that God will give us mercy. It's just been a cry that I've had throughout the day. I lay down in bed tonight, most every night. That's how I go to sleep, just asking God over and over again to give us mercy. We have nothing to claim but His mercy. That's all we can. And uh, I just think, when you think about communism and socialism, people's lives will be hurt. Period. And I, I think about that. How I many people's lives will be hurt? And so um, I'm not. Um, I'm not going to say there is a conspiracy, as man would say. But there certainly is a conspiracy on Satan's in Satan's regards. He's conspiring to take over, to bring in his kingdom. And he's done it before. He's he's tried before. And, to do that, uh, Hitler was certainly a was certainly um, and um, um, was certainly an opportunity. Or and and uh, that word is there; it's somewhere just rolling around in my head. It was an attempt. It was an attempt of Satan to, to usher in his kingdom, and he's done this many times. And so, um, with Satan, as Christ said, he's come to steal and to kill. And so um, we know Satan always doesn't. Satan doesn't want to bring life and liberty. That's what Christ brings. Amen. He gives life. I've came to give you life and to bring it to you and to give it to you more abundantly. Amen. Our the foundation of our country was formed by people who had come to learn about the God of our Bible. And uh, they're trying not only to take away, change our governmental system, but they're, they're trying to take away from us the God, the God of our Bible, separated from our culture. So just be in prayer, prayer for that. But I say again, it'll be okay no matter what happens. We'll still have it. And so we're going to die anyway. Uh, and um, But I'm not... Uh, I don't want to go out in a flame of glory like that, you know. Okay, we're in uh, Philippians chapter number 4, and we'll uh, jump in here and, and uh, continue on. We've been talking about just uh, maintaining our relationship with the Lord. And you remember Philippians 4, as we've talked about, is Paul's last epistle. He was uh, in prison not long after this, as best we can tell. Um, and he was... 
he was executed. Um, and, and I read chapter 4, and, and oftentimes I read it. I look at these first verses, and I really look as Paul's trying to really cram a lot of things in at the very end. Remember these things. Remember, hold on to them. Mm -hmm. Just like we do our children before they go somewhere. Now make sure you wipe your nose. Make sure your nose. My mother always said that. I, I, I carried the handkerchief all my life. And she, every time I went out the door, she'd always make sure there was a handkerchief in my back pocket. Clean your nose, Marty. Clean your nose. She still, she still does that. And, um, I talked to her on the phone. She said, do you have your handkerchief? She's like, come on, Mom. I'm, you know, I'm, do you have, no, I don't. Go get your handkerchief. <laughs> but, I've had a messy nose at the wrong times, you know, so she, she's trying to help me out. My wife tries to help me out, too. I was leading choir one time uh, when we, right after we first were married, and I was just going at it, just leading the choir, you know. There was about 30 people in the choir, and she was trying to get my attention. You know, she was trying to do something discreet, and it was frustrating me because I was concentrating on the lead and singing. And so I stopped. Piano, stop. Organ, stop. Everybody, stop. I looked at her. Now, what do you want? What is it you want? She said, Your zipper's down. <laughs> uh, all right. So, anyway, I got what I asked for, didn't I? I asked for it. So, anyway, but uh, you know, so this last man, that was a preacher. It was a very, very preacher. It was great, the use of God. He was pastored a big ministry and had a Bible college and so forth. And he was talking to a young preacher. And a young preacher said, he said, I just want to learn something from you. He said, just, what is the, I mean, tell me what's the last thing you do before you step out to go out and preach? He said, I always check and make sure my zipper's up. He said, that's the last thing. He thought he was going to hear something, you know, like I pray or I hold my hand. Or, you know. Anyway, where am I going? I don't even know what I'm doing. Uh, Philippians 4, talking about just those last minute things. And so we've gone over just different things about uh, things that need to stay right. Last week we discussed about working right. And if you uh, will jog your memory, we just talked about dealing with that spirit of rebellion that can so easily come out of us. Paul said, the things you've heard and seen in me, verse number uh, 9, the things uh, things that both have learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and to God of peace be with you. Talked about the idea of order and structure, that God in turn is a God of order and structure. And Paul was called to churches, understanding the culture, understanding genders and the ages and all of those things and he worked to bring into what's the most precious jewel of the church. What's the most precious jewel of the church? It's unity. How good and how sweet when the brethren dwell in unity. That's what David said. Yeah. Boy, I need it terrible when there's no unity. It's terrible in the home when there's no unity. It's terrible in it. The kids, you know, you can feel it at times. There's unity and then one child walks in the room and you just feel the spirit change. You don't have to say anything, but your spirit carries with it an attitude. And uh, it breaks unity. And so we talked about that last week, about uh, the idea of following. You know, Paul in turn, he says, mark those ones who don't follow. And, and we, we'll have a hundred people, and a hundred people in turn will all do what's right. And then one person in the crowd will say, where does it say that in the Bible? <laughs> Doesn't say anything. Well, it may not say anything in the Bible about that. But can I say to you that unity is important. And as I was, I used the analogy last week of my home that, uh, you know, we talked about eating. And my wife and I made the decision a long time ago that whatever she'd make put on the table, we'd eat. Now, I'll tell you, it's been a challenge for me at times. Now, I don't mean that sarcastically because uh, she would fix some of um, her native foods that she loves. And my palate wasn't adjusted to that. And uh, she's kind that she doesn't, you know, she's kind that she doesn't um, always, you know, she has been kind to me about that. But boy, and she'd flop a fish down there and eyeballs are still in it looking at me. And, yeah, yeah, I, I couldn't get past that, you know. But whatever was put in front of me, I'm supposed to eat. And so I would practice it. Well, we had it for the kids. Well, that's order and structure. He said, where's that in the Bible? It's not in the Bible. And if you don't want to do that in your home, that's okay. It doesn't, you know, if you're not doing that, that doesn't mean you're wrong. 
It's just somebody in the house had to make a decision how we're going to do things, and we made a decision. If we just said to the kids, now listen kids, we in this home are only going to follow the Bible. Now what do you think that means? These kids would run around naked, <laughs> using the bathroom everywhere, eating whenever they want to, going to bed when they want to, turning on, turning off, because none of that's in the Bible. Dad, we're following the Bible. Someone's got to put order and structure. And as soon as you put order and structure, someone says, well, that's not in the Bible, and I don't want to do it that way. Well, that's fine. That's fine, you know. And so anyway, that's what we were talking about last week. And, and so we need to be, things have to change. We know things have to change. Um, you know, like paneling. I'm glad paneling has changed. I'm, I'm, I don't like paneling. Can I get amen on that? <laughs> And, and so, but this was a time when paneling was, was really the thing. That was really the thing. And I'm, I'm looking forward to the day when it's not the thing here. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. And I hope that I don't offend anybody with that. And if I do, I'm sorry. I, I don't like paneling. I, and I'm just joking about all that. But things change, and we know. But as we talked about last week, before we ever change anything, we need to understand why, why the fence was put there in the first place. There was a reason. And I Here's a good illustration of it. We talk about uh, beards and mustaches. And you know, there was, we've gone through um, uh, Christianity, a, a good period of time in Christianity where beards and mustaches was more identified with hippies. And uh, boy, the preachers back in the 60s and 70s and 80s, they really would cut a rug about the hippies, the hippie movement. The hippie movement, they, they iconically identify with being shaggy-faced and so forth. And so the preachers automatically started saying, hey, you know, we're not hippies. And of course, the hippies of the 60s and the 70s were not the same as the hippies of the day. And they, in turn, were peaceniks and communists and so forth and, you know, free love and, you know, and all of that. And so um, a lot of the preachers then, in turn, would say, we, uh, you know, we, we, we in turn stand against that. And they led by example, being clean cut. And they would cut their beard and cut their mustaches, the college I attended. I walked into college, I can remember hearing them saying that. You know, we're not hippies, we cut our hair. Or something. They didn't say it quite that direct, but that was the idea. Well, it wasn't a problem for me, I didn't really care one way or another. But you know, that isn't an issue today. You know, hippies are not an issue today. And yet, in Christendom, there, there's been those who turn, they, they say, well, I'd like to grow a beard. There are preachers and churches that have grown beard. And other churches look at them and say, well, look at it. They're not godly anymore. They're not spiritual because they have beards, they have mustaches, and so forth. Well, the truth of the matter is, is that Beards and mustaches distinguish men from women. Christ had a beard. You know, it's the one thing I can do that my wife can't do. Amen? It's the one thing. About everything else she can do that I can't do, but uh, I, I can do. But the, the, that, was, that is the picture of a man. It doesn't mean that it's right or wrong. But somehow, somehow, it has crept into to corners of Christianity that if you wear a beard or a mustache... Uh, then in turn you're, you're liberal or you're, you're wayward or modernistic, etc. Well, it's, that's a good example. I think we need to stop, and I'm not saying us, but I think that those ones who stop and look back, why was that, that established, why was that order of structure put into Christendom anyway, into this church or this cult? Why was it put there? And understanding that is important to know whether or not defense should be taken down. And so keep that order in that structure. Okay, today we're going to talk about uh, verse number 11 in uh, this passage. It says here, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be a base, I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. In reality, Paul is really given an address about his life as a missionary, I guess we could say, living as an evangelist, a missionary evangelist. But when I look at verse number 11, verse number 12, what I see in this is that Paul's identifying how he, how he was, how that a person should keep a right attitude. Keep a right attitude. How difficult that is. Look, if you will, in Proverbs chapter number 25. 
Proverbs chapter 25, uh, when Paul says, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am in therewith to be content. I don't think he's talking so much about, um, about things. When we think of contentment, we often think about, Oh, I just have, you know, I just have a, a flip phone and I don't have a, a, you know, a really smartphone. And so, I, you know, I, but I need to be content. And so, I don't think he's really talking about things. I think he's really more referring to situations. And, and he goes on to say, you know, I've, I've been full and I've, and I've abounded, but there's other times that I've been empty and I've, I've suffered. I've not had, you know, I've hungered. And he said, but no matter what the situation, I have been content. Now, you're in uh, Proverbs chapter 25. Are you there? Say amen. He that hath, verse 28, he that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. No rule. You remember the story of the children of Israel. Uh, they tore the walls down. Nebuchadnezzar tore down the walls, took out the temple, tore down the walls. That's a double. I mean, it was a double. They, they lost their source of a good spirit. Then they lost their protection for their body by way of these walls. No one wants to live there. Now, the no rule is talking about the walls that you put up in your life to protect your Yourself, to protect your spirit. And a person who has no rule is like a city whose walls have been broken down. Have you ever been around someone who had to walk on eggshells? <laughs> Help me out. Do you have you? Isn't it a blessing when you're around someone and, uh, and you know that, 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 that they'll take care of themselves. No matter what you say or what you do, they're okay. I think we should be considerate of one another. Um, and I think that, you know, they're, that I'm not saying, uh, you know, like, uh, like we sometimes will say, well, that's just how I am. You just got to accept that. I think you have, you and I have some responsibility with one another. But it's nice when you're around people that you understand that they are mature enough that they protect their spirit. And even if you do something wrong, they can metabolize. They can, they can deal with it. Well, have I ever made some mistakes? I mean, I've just gone campaigns, said words. Um, you know, I've shied away from people and done things to them I shouldn't have done and so forth because of my spirit, you know. And I've gotten upset or in turn I've invoked or provoked someone else's spirit. I've done it and I'm ashamed of it. I don't like it. I'm proud of it. But uh, as, I, as I grow older more and more I realize that, that I should be sovereign in this regard to ruling my own spirit. <laughs> That it should never be dependent upon my circumstances. Now, I'm not there. You know, is anybody there? <laughs> Are any of you there? I'm not there. But um, I think I do much better than what I did when I was younger. You want to shut that curtain, Miss Francis? Yeah, shut that. Okay. You okay? All right. Are you saluting me? I'm still seeing you. You can? Okay. <laughs> Um, so it's um, uh, so guarding your own spirit, mature, keeping a mature spirit. But it's the idea that you're sovereign as an individual in regards to your spirit. That you just you can walk about in the circumstances of your life and turn on always robbing you and stealing away like walls broken down, coming and taking away from you things that are very important or very precious. Um, I was talking to a uh, director of a of a um a mission board and and he said to me he said Marty surprisingly he said but the two reasons the two main reasons why people missionaries leave the field is is one because of noise the other is because of dust he said he'd been involved in missions for a little while and started a missions board he said one was called the noise which we can understand because um, um, most third world countries there, there's really no there's no regard as far as sound. And then uh, a lot of countries are hot. They don't have good windows. It's not insulated. I was in Miss Aquila's house the other day, and I thought, it's so quiet in here. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's, there's no little kids running around like I have in my house. That was part of it. But, <laughs> but houses are just quiet anyway uh, because we have good windows and doors and air conditioners and so forth. When you get into Africa or your Asian countries and so forth, they don't, most people don't have those. And so all the noise is on the street and everything's concrete just echoes about. Mm -hmm. and 
and they people drive around the streets with those big sound systems on the car and make all the public announcements. Uh, in Nicaragua, they'd start what time in the morning? I don't remember now. Five o'clock, six o'clock in the morning. So if someone died, someone were to die, then they would go to hi and hire someone who then would drive around all the neighborhoods on this huge loudspeaker. And so and so has passed away, and you know they're going to have service, and they'll tell when the service is at. And it was it was very loud, very loud. They play music before and after to get your attention. Then they'd make the announcement. And then if there was any type of a special event or Holiday. Th these are people, that's what they did for a living. You hired them. That was the advertisement agency. You know, they drove around the car with big boom boxes on top of them. I mean, you couldn't think. Uh, dust. Now, I'm not belittling that, but it's, but it, it just find it interesting. What does it take to tear down your spirit? For you to lose your attitude. What does it take? And I guess in a perfect world, everything would be perfect. But we're not in a perfect world. We have sounds and dust, and we have people around us that, that really, they look like the people are like scratching their fingernails on a chalkboard. That's how they are toward it. We have family. Yeah, we have family. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm not going to even comment on that, brother. What are you eating today? You want to come to my house, huh? <laughs> right. And so, um, so all these things just they just work, you know. And there's things that are pet peeves for me. Things that, that, if that's the word, I guess, things that really bother me. I, when my the boys and I, when we started mowing grass, I, I just can't stand it. I just cannot stand it to see see them standing around and, and just twiddling things. I think, oh, it just drives me crazy. I mean, drive me nuts, nuts. You don't you just. They know they don't want to work with me because if we're going to work, we're going to work. If we're going to sit around, we're going to sit around really hard. We're just going to do it with all of our might. But just this pulling up to a house and lollygagging and tying your shoe and adjusting your glasses and walking around. Oh, I mean, oh, it was, I mean, it was hard for me, really hard. And so five minutes or so before we got to the house, I say, okay, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? All right, we're going to do it. Now, get it. As soon as we get on there, it's just, you know, we're jumping out of the car. Run. I want to see you run. Run, run. You know, you want to eat tonight? You're going to run and you're going to mow that lawn. You got it? But that's something that has, you know, for me, that's just my personality makeup. It doesn't make it right or wrong. But I, I've had to be careful. And I would get, at times in my life, I've gotten locked in with people who are not that way. <laughs> And they are more methodical. They don't make as many mistakes as I make. They don't stick their foot in their mouth as much as I do. I mean, there's a lot of good benefits about it, but they just are so slow. And I think, I can't take this. I can't take it. I'm going crazy. I can't take it. But you know, <clears throat> you can't go through life and say, I don't want dust, and I don't want sound, and I only want people that I like, and I want this. You can't do that. You just can't do it. And so if your life, if you, if you think the way to protect, if we think, Thing. The way to protect our spirit is by dismissing everything in our life that in turn affects, affects our spirit and tears our spirit down. Then, then in turn, Satan will use that against you to the point you'll start whittling off everything that's important to you in life. To the point that it'll come to your, your children, to your marriage, everything. And I have watched that happen. And so, if I if I appear as though I get a little frustrated, don't just don't even pay attention to it. I'm, I believe I've got to learn to protect my spirit, and I believe that you, any person here, should not have the ability to take and uh, take away my my proper spirit for me to have a bad. I believe that. I don't always succeed in it, but I believe that, and I want to walk around sovereign. And I don't mean as a dictator, but sovereign in my rule over my spirit. That you're not going to take my joy and my happiness. That you're not going to make me cranky. You're not going to make me complainy and mad and angry and frustrated and, and uh, you know, all of that. You're not going to do that. Now, I'm saying that's my desire. 
You may do it. Somebody, in fact, may say, well, I'm going to see if I can be the one to frustrate. <laughs> somebody may be the one here. There's probably somebody here that'll... That's my desire. Yeah. <laughs> But that's my desire. My desire is that I can be sovereign. And if you are a person that has never had those thoughts, but your thoughts has been, well, you know, I just don't like that person, and I'm just not, I just don't like, I just, you know, and I don't like, I just, if that's how you are, then I promise you, Satan will use that against you, and you'll find that your life will become smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, it's nice to have air conditioner. But did you know there was many years in this country that there was cars without air conditioners and people had to love each other and get along? <laughs> you know, we were in Nicaragua, we had a uh, Suburban. And we would, we would all get in the Suburban. Thirteen of us in the Suburban. It's an eight-seater. And we'd pile them all in, you know, sit in the seats. And then there was some open up the boot in the back and threw a few of them back there and set. And the air conditioner, I could never get it to work. I tried. I spent money on it. I gave up, you know. Um, and so, you know, it was uncomfortable, you know. And ultimately, some child in the back, you know, would... You know, they would get frustrated with another child or, you know, all of that. And I get it. I get the heat and conditions and cold. I get it. I get it. But, but in turn, we shouldn't allow ourselves to justify having a bad spirit ever. Heat or cold or pressures, all these things, you know. And, uh, and, I, I'm, and believe me, I've, my family knows I'm not attempting to be a hypocrite. I want to live what I'm practicing, and I attempt to live what I'm practicing. But I am not a person that always keeps my spirit right. I'm not saying that I do. But what I'm telling you, I believe. And I correct myself on it. And it's my job to keep my spirit right, not your job to keep it right for me. I don't want people to walk on eggshells when they're around me. I want to be mature enough that if you, you if you're having a bad day and you come in and you're cranky, then I can just smile and give you a hug and go on. And it won't affect me. And if you come in and you just, you know, someone you're believing a lie and you're being critical of me for some reason, that I just say, well, you know, the Lord loves me. Praise God for that. I have a birthday coming up. You know, praise God for that. And I go on. But my life doesn't go up and down based upon how you treat me and what you're trying to take from me or what you're trying to do for me. Now, honestly, that's how most people live their life. It's the truth. Most people live their life that way. And, and, and they... This week I met this man and this lady. It was just f fascinating to listen to him talk. And they're not safe people, but that's exactly what's happened to them. They just more and more and more cocoon themselves to a point. They go nowhere. They stay to themselves. They work for themselves. And, and, and they have no friends and so forth. And it's because of this. Now... Paul here is explaining that in his life, he said, God has taught me that no matter what the circumstances are, that I'm just content, content in it. Well, it's just, it's fine. I'm con well, you're not going to be content unless you realize that God is all that you need and God is all that you want. <laughs> And so, if you in turn are in a pit as Joseph, or if you're in the, you know, Potiphar's servant, or you're in prison, uh, whatever may be the case, or now you're in the palace, you know, Joseph, we never see a recorded time in scriptures where he complained. And I'm sure that Joseph felt it, thought it, maybe even spoke it, but it certainly wasn't his attitude. That wasn't how the Lord wanted to characterize him because that wasn't who Joseph was. Joseph was a man who was content with God. And he allowed that. And that's why in Psalm, uh, Genesis 50, he was able to say, you know, what you intended for evil, God meant it for good. Jo Joseph, in turn, he understood that there was a God that he possessed and that possessed him, and that was all that he needed. And so, what does it take for you to have a good attitude? And I've had a couple of my kids that, that I think this was probably one of their greater, greater weaknesses. Uh, and it's been interesting for me to, to know, to, to help them. Um, I tried force, that doesn't work too good. And so I've tried, you know, uh, bribing them, that didn't work too good. 
but the truth is is that it's grace is where we find success over a bad attitude or bad spirit that we struggle with it comes by grace grace is a supernatural disposition is created in you by the Holy Spirit or you could say grace is the enabling of God's Spirit inside of you. Grace is what is given. You don't always have all grace, but you have grace. God gives grace when you need grace. Grace is what's given to you whenever, you know, your husband passes away, Miss Joyce. Grace is what's given to you whenever someone rises up against you and they're slandering you and wanting to take and destroy your life. Grace enables you so that you don't have to have a bad spirit, be jealous, envious, attacking, unkind, and all these heart sins that come out. It's grace. Grace. That comes to you by the Spirit of God. Now we should have walls and disciplines in our life, yes, but the walls and disciplines are not, you know, fortified it's fortification so you can keep those people out or those things out that in turn you don't want to touch you. That's you're so weak when you do that. <laughs> You should be strong enough that you in turn, that no one can rob you because you're being protected by the promises of God's Word and by His Spirit's enabling. God wants you to have grace and to live it out. Listen to what the songwriter said. Every need He is supplying, wondrous grace He bestows. Uh, that's is in the song, The Longer I Love Him. Another verse, every day my way seems brighter, the longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. The, the more that I love him, more love he bestows. Each day is like heaven, my cup overflows. The longer that I serve him, the sweeter he grows. The songwriter's confessing about how that God's satisfying. I mean, I'm just overfilled with everything that I have from God, so it does nothing else. It's relative. Nothing else is comparable. Um, there's a great, great uh, story out there. I just need to, I need to get that and, and make copies of it and give it to everybody. But it's a story about the um, the pineapple. Has anybody heard of the pineapple story? It, my, the Lord used that in my wife and I's life some years ago. It's a missionary. He's in New Guinea. He planted a pineapple. Uh, it's pineapple, isn't it? A pineapple in the backyard. Pineapple. Pineapples take how many years? Three years? Seven, Seven years to grow. And so um, he's trying to grow pineapples in his backyard. He had a bunch of pineapple plants. And these uh, natives would come in and steal it. Anyway, but they didn't even steal that. They stole everything. They stole everything. His, they stole his pins to put his baby diapers on his babies. They stole jewelry, the Bibles, everything and everything. And he became such a nervous wreck and frustrated at it. This is back in the 60s and 70s that he was strung out on all kinds of antidepressants and so forth. I mean, he was a nervous wreck because of it. he couldn't get it off his mind. He was frustrated. They're stealing from him. They're taking from him. This man's ministry was a wreck because he couldn't control how he felt toward these, the native people there in New Guinea because they were always stealing and taking from him. You know? And so he finally got a hold of it. It's a really good story. I got to get the story for you. And uh, God, in turn, helped him through that. And he was able to, I won't spoil it, but he was able to learn how to, to control his spirit in that way. And it was by grace. And, and the result of it was it turned around that many people got saved and the church was established. It revolutionized what he was doing before he had no ministry, really had no ministry at all. And so. Um, but it doesn't take, when you think about it in our life, I ask you to just be honest about yourself and, and what does it take for you to have a bad day? You know, in times I'll say, uh, you know, my wife or I, one, will have a bad day around the house. And I'll say, what is it? Well, it's this. It's that. And this happened. And that happened. And, you know, when somebody does something wrong, it's hard to get over it then. You know, it's just, you just, it's not like flipping a pancake where you can just go to the other side and forget about it. But what does it take for you to get in a bad spirit? Is it news? Is it comments? Is it... You know, house not being clean? Is it dirty laundry? Is it someone not keeping an appointment? Is someone lying to you? What does it take? Now I ask you, how are you going to deal with that? What are you going to do? Are you going to shut every mouth that speaks ill against you? 
you going to have to always go and buy another new house because the house you have isn't what you want it to be? What are you going to do to correct that? And if you think it through, you'll realize that there's really no hope for you having a good spirit and controlling your attitude except for, you know, except for just getting rid of things and people and separating and so forth because I can't control anybody. I can't control any one of you. Or in turn, you can find the grace that God gives you. So that when death comes, you can still have joy. So when criticisms come, you may shed a tear, but you can still in your own heart have a good spirit. And when people turn on you, and people hurt you, and they will, then you in turn won't use your tongue as a sword to attack them and hurt them back. You can do that. But that's going to come by grace. God wants you and I to learn that no matter what type, what state that we're in in our life, oh goodness, it's time to go. Brother Edwin, you can go ahead and ring the bell. Uh, what state that we are in life, that we are content, uh, that we're content. We have little, we have much. We're in prison or we're not. We, you know, we're popular or we're not popular. We're unpopular. We have everything we need or we have bills that we don't want. You know, no matter what it may be, that we can find ourselves content because God is all we need and God is all that we want. That's what contentment is. And so God wants you and I to control our spirit, to keep a right attitude. Now, having said that, I have to say this, that emotions were given to us by God. And so I don't want to insinuate that it's wrong for you to express emotions. Someone passes away, it's proper and right for you to grieve. And you should grieve. Don't suppress that. Tears should be shed. If uh, someone in turn, you know, attacks you, then it's, it's normal and it's right. We, you know, we shouldn't take that away. You know, we understand even the Christ, that He picked up a whip, overturned the tables, He drove out. We saw, we saw this anger. Anger is an emotion that's given by God and has a purpose. Sadness. He's had purpose. But in exercising these emotions that God has given you, you never want the ex emotions to control you. You control your emotions. They're used. They're used for purpose. And so that's what, that's what I believe that Paul was trying to explain here, that we should learn to be content with God. Anger is needed. Sadness is required. You know, joy obviously should be a constant state. But these emotions should be, they should flow with us. And we should be comfortable to sovereignly, be sovereign in how we rule over our spirit by way of the Holy Spirit that's within us. Amen. Okay, you guys can stand. And we'll have church tonight. Um, and we'll have a good time tonight. Amen? I think my battery went dead, Brother Steve. I guess Steve got tired of me preaching, so he just killed the battery. I'm going to walk to the back door, and um, I'm going to ask Brother John if he'll dismiss us in prayer. Um, and then tonight we'll see you, okay? Treat bags as we go out. Oh, yeah. What was that? Treat bags. Treat bags as we go out. I thought you said hit John Bragg. <laughs> yeah, hit John Bragg as you go out. <laughs> <laughs>